Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and for the invitation to speak today. It's really a pleasure uh, to have the chance to tell you a bit about multi-agent reinforcement learning, which is one of my favorite research topics. The work I'm going to present is joint work with uh, the many collaborators who are listed on this slide. Most of these collaborators are current or former students or postdocs in my lab, um, but some are also from other Oxford departments, including statistics and information engineering, uh, with whom we collaborate closely. Um, so as you no doubt know, the standard paradigm in reinforcement learning involves a single agent interacting with a stationary environment, producing sensory input and selecting actions in order to maximize a reward signal. And while this is a, a powerful and broadly applicable paradigm, one key limitation of it is that it assumes the learning agent is the only agent in the world. So a natural extension is thus to the multi-agent paradigm in which each agent acknowledges and reasons about the fact that the environment with which it interacts consists of other agents who are also perceiving input and selecting actions in order to accrue reward. This uh, extension is natural because multi-agent systems are everywhere. The real world is full of scenarios that are naturally modeled with multiple agents. So if we want to build intelligent agents that can act in the real world and solve real world problems, we need to tackle this multi-agent paradigm. Now, um, at a high level, we can group multi-agent systems into three categories, fully cooperative, fully competitive, and mixed settings. I'm sure I don't need to explain the difference uh, between these to this audience, but uh, let me just make clear that this talk focuses entirely on cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning. Not because the other settings aren't important or interesting, but because even in the fully cooperative case, we already have plenty of research challenges to keep us busy. And thanks to its similarity to the single agent setting, uh, formalizing the objective of learning uh, is straightforward in the fully cooperative setting. In addition, the cooperative setting is important because a large number of these real world multi-agent systems are cooperative, like a team of robots in a warehouse, or they contain subgroups that can be usefully modeled as cooperative, like a fleet of self-driving cars sharing public roads with human drivers. Um, now, multi-agent reinforcement learning has been a key focus of my research group since I joined Oxford in 2015. Uh, and almost all of that work has been on cooperative settings. Uh, as you can see from this list, uh, we love a good acronym. Um, but today, rather than trying to give you a survey of all this work, which would sort of be necessarily superficial, I want to do something that I don't usually do, which is devote the entire talk to a single method. And that's uh, the QMIX method that we published in 2018. And to be honest, it's not an obvious choice. It's not our newest work. It's not our most cited paper. Uh, it didn't win a best paper award. It's not the most sophisticated uh, algorithmically. On the contrary, it's really quite a simple idea. But I've chosen it because out of all the methods that we've developed, it's the one that has really proved reliable and effective across repeated empirical evaluations. And that still um, two years later proves challenging to outperform despite a really quite a lot of algorithmic innovation that's occurring in this area. Perhaps for this reason, it's also the method from, from my group that has most influenced the community and that, that others have built upon the most. But um, there's another reason also. Um, so as a supervisor, I often struggle to get my students to look beyond publication as like the end goal of research. So I'm always pushing them, you know, look deeper, analyze further, even after the work is published. But being PhD students, they usually just uh, ignore me and do whatever they want. Um, but in this case, they actually did what I asked and they performed a bunch of extra benchmarking experiments, ablations and analysis to not only confirm the utility of QMIX as a learning algorithm, but also to shed some light on the sometimes unexpected reasons why it actually works. Um, but before we get into the method, we have to get really clear on the problem setting. And this is a common source of confusion because once you depart from the simplicity of the single agent setting, there's like an explosion of possible settings, each with different assumptions about uh, what kind of agents there are, how, what they can observe, what actions they can take, how they are rewarded. Um, and at one point I got so frustrated with people um, misunderstanding what our problem setting 
that I asked uh, Jacob Forrester, who at the time was my PhD student, um, can you just make a single slide that just clearly encapsulates the problem setting we're working on so that nobody is confused? And uh, so this is what he came up with. You can judge for yourself whether he succeeded. So the setting, of course, is, is multi-agent and cooperative, as I've already said. It's also partially observable, which means each agent has its own private and partial view of the global state. And as we'll see, this turns out to be crucial because it's this partial observability that makes the setting truly multi-agent. In addition, we require that the policies that are learned by the agents can be executed in a decentralized fashion. So that means each agent can condition only on its own history of private observations, not those of the other agents. However, we assume that learning takes place in a simulator or some other safe setting like a laboratory, such that the learning process can be centralized. So the agents, they can share parameters, observations, gradients, whatever you want, there are no rules, as long as the resulting policies are amenable to this decentralized execution. So to formalize this setting, let's start with the basics, the single agent MVP. I'm going to assume you're familiar with this, but I will just note that uh, in our notation, the action uh, is denoted with U, not A, because A will later be used to, to refer to the agent. So we have um, a transition and reward functions. The return is a discounted sum of rewards and the value functions represent conditional expected returns. Okay. Now, the simplest way to make this setting multi-agent is just to add a separate action space for each agent. So every agent still sees the global state, but it can select its own action. So A here in the superscript indicates which, action, which agent is taking the action. The transition and reward functions, they're the same as before, but now they condition on the joint action. And the joint action is a vector of the action choices for each agent. I'm using bold here to indicate vectors. Now, as you may have already noticed, there's nothing fundamentally multi-agent about the multi-agent MVP. In fact, we can think of it as just a single agent MVP with a factored action space. So in other words, taking an action means specifying a whole vector as if a, like a single puppeteer agent was controlling a bunch of robots from above. So that's why partial observability is crucial to making the setting truly multi-agent and this can be modeled with the decentralized, partially observable Markov decision process or DECPOMDP. So in addition to the elements already introduced, we have an observation function that conditions not only on the global state, but on the agent, such that each agent has a different um, private and partial view of the world. Now, due to this partial observability, the agents will generally want to condition um, on their entire action observation history, which is called tau. And the goal of learning is to produce a set of decentralized policies in which each agent doesn't condition on anything except this private history. Now, this constraint can be motivated in two ways. There's the, uh, what I call the natural decentralization in which you have like real world communication or sensory constraints that require decentralization. But there's also the, uh, the artificial decentralization in which none of those constraints exist inherently but we as designers artificially impose them in order to make learning more tractable by, for example, forcing each agent to consider only a local field of view, thereby simplifying its uh, control problem. And of course, as I already mentioned, we're performing centralized learning of decentralized policies so we can do whatever we like during training, as long as the result is a set of policies that obey this decentralization constraint. Now, I've become a bit of an evangelist for this setting because a core belief of mine is that making progress on hard problems is often about finding the right assumptions. So we're looking for assumptions that give us a lot of leverage on the problem, but which also mostly or approximately hold in the real world. So they're like maximally useful assumptions. And I believe that this assumption meets these criteria. We don't deploy robots in the real world tabula rasa. We train them in a simulator or a laboratory first because otherwise it's too expensive and dangerous. And centralizing that training process is a powerful tool in learning coordinated behavior among cooperative agents. In fact, it's, it's such a crucial part of the problem setting that at a certain point I decided to make my own slide to complement Jacobs. Um, and here it is uh, in honor of my teenage uh, musical tastes. Um, 
Of course, the community completely ignored me and they adopted a different acronym instead, instead of CTDC, CTDE, Centralized Training with Decentralized Execution, which I have no technical objection to. It's a perfectly accurate description of the setting, but unfortunately it does not sound like the name of a rock band. Um, so one way to get some intuition about the DEC -POM DP is to reason about what I call the predictability exploitation dilemma. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the exploration exploitation dilemma from single agent reinforcement learning. So this is like a different but related dilemma. On the one hand, the agents need to exploit because obviously maximizing performance means collecting reward. And in a single agent setting, this requires exploiting what you observe. So if you see a coin to your left, you know which way you need to go to collect coins. But in the deck POMDP, the agents cannot explicitly communicate. So coordinating with each other requires maintaining predictability. They need to stick to the plan that they agreed on during the centralized training phase. Otherwise they risk miscoordinating with their teammates. So sometimes being predictable requires ignoring even highly relevant private observations if it's unlikely that your teammates have received similar information. So in the extreme case, the optimal policy could even be completely open loop, ignoring all private observations because conditioning on them is just too risky. It's too unpredictable to your teammates. So when does the benefit of exploiting private observations outweigh the cost in predictability? This is the central dilemma faced by the deck -POM DP agents. Okay, now the simplest approach we can take algorithmically is called independent learning. So this was first proposed as independent queue learning way back in 93. And the idea is that each agent simply learns independently with its own queue function that conditions on its private observation history and individual action. Nothing is centralized and there's no attempt to learn a joint value function that conditions on the joint action. So each agent essentially treats other agents as if they were part of the environment. And of course, we can do the same thing with an actor critic approach where each agent has its own actor and critic. Now, if we have centralized training, then a sort of obvious improvement to this is to share parameters across the agents during learning. So this can speed up the learning and improve generalization. The agents can still behave differently because they receive different inputs. And those inputs can even include like an index that tells the agent which agent it is. And as a result, the agents can still behave arbitrarily heterogeneously, even though they share policy, they share the same policy. Now it's natural to ask whether such learning could still be called independent, given that they, they're sharing a policy, but it is still independent in the important sense that the value functions that are learned in this way condition only on private observations and individual actions. So there's no joint value function. Obviously, this is a naive approach, a key limitation is that because each agent treats the other agents as part of its environment, if those agents are also learning, then the environment from that agent's perspective becomes non-stationary. And so convergence guarantees go out the window. In addition, there's, since there's no attempt to learn a joint value function, the, the synergistic value of coordination is not represented, which makes it harder to learn coordinated behavior. So one way that we can do better is to take an actor-critic approach and centralize the critic. So the critic conditions on the global states, as shown here, um, uh, uh, the joint history and, and maybe even the joint action. Centralizing the critic makes sense because the critic is only needed during training. So once you deploy, you can discard the critic and just use the policies to act. And in general, anything that you discard before deployment is like a great candidate for centralization. So this also makes explicit the motivation for taking an actor critic approach because actor critic methods are appealing anytime you have what I like to call a hard greedification problem. So anytime finding the greedy action with respect to a value function is itself a non-trivial problem, then we have hard greedification. So the classic example of this is when you have a continuous action space, and this is indeed the typical setting in which actor critic methods are used. But here we have another hard greedification problem because we have a centralized value function that's this, this centralized critic, from which we need to learn decentralized policies. So actor critic methods can do that by having each actor incrementally update its policy following a policy gradient, which is different for each agent, but which is estimated from the same centralized critic. So that's what's shown in the figure here. We have the centralized critic, we have separate actors. Um, they each compute their own gradient, but, but by referencing the same common centralized critic. Okay, 
However, learning a centralized value function over a complex action space can be challenging. So a crucial idea to address this is to learn factor value functions instead. And factor value functions have a long history in reinforcement learning and an even longer one in decision theoretic planning. The idea is to represent the value function as a sum of local value functions, each of which depends on the observations and actions of only a subset of the agents. So each of these um, uh, values of E corresponds to a different subset. So this can be modeled with a coordination graph, which is just a factor graph in which the factors are the local value functions and the variables are the agents. So just like in a probabilistic graphical model, a coordination graph captures conditional independent properties. So here, for example, agent one, if it knows the action of agent two, it can select its own action without caring about what action agent three is going to take. So such a factorization reduces the number of parameters that need to be learned, thereby speeding learning and improving generalization. It also makes it tractable to maximize over the joint action space since your favorite message, pa message passing algorithms for performing map inference in probabilistic graphical models can be reused to efficiently find the maximizing joint action. Now, um, as is often the case, DeepMind uh, was the first to sort of deep learnify this idea um, in an approach that they called value decomposition networks. And value decomposition networks use the most extreme form of factorization with one factor per agent yielding this disconnected factor graph. Now, while this is obviously a highly restrictive uh, factorization, it has an important side effect, which is that it enables a total decentralization of the max and argmax. So because each factor involves only one agent, we can compute a max over the joint actions just by performing a max over each agent's individual action space separately and then summing them. Similarly, we can compute a global argmax by just performing a separate local argmax for each agent and then compiling the resulting actions into a vector that would yield exactly the same vector that we would get if we would do the sort of combinatorial argmax over the joint action space. So what this means is that with the VDN factorization, um, we no longer have a hard greedification problem. Finding the greedy action with respect to a value function is easy again. So we're no longer compelled to take an actor critic approach. We can just use Q learning instead if we want. So here, for example, we have a DQN loss function where the Q, where the Q function is centralized. So thanks to the VDN factorization, this maximization that appears here in the update target can be performed efficiently as shown uh, above. And on deployment action selection using this learned value function trivially decentralizes since it requires only the decentralized argmax that I just mentioned. Okay, so at long last, this brings us to QMix. The main idea behind QMix was to try to preserve this handy property of decentralizing the argmax, while at the same time loosening the restrictive representation imposed by VDN's extreme factorization. So we can do that by leveraging the simple observation that to preserve the decentralizability of the argmax, it suffices to enforce the condition that for all agents, the partial derivative of the joint value function with respect to the agent's individual value functions is non-negative. Now, one potential source of confusion here is that because we're considering discrete action spaces, these individual Q values are actually only defined for a set of discrete points uh, corresponding to that agent's individual action space. So what does it even mean to take a derivative with respect to this discrete set of values? So this, this figure shows here what's really happening. When we compute the centralized value from the individual values, we do so using a mixing function, which we can think of as taking real valued continuous inputs. So this color gradient here shows a mixing function that obeys this monotonicity constraint. Because if you look with respect to any individual Q value, you see that it's, uh, the partial derivative is always positive. It's increasing monotonically. Um, now, so it's this, it's this mixing function whose partial derivatives must be non-negative in order to obey the monotonicity constraint. And in VDN, the, that mixing function is just a summation. But the point is, the insight here is that any monotonic function would do. Now, in practice, the mixing function is only ever applied um, to, the, to a discrete set of inputs. 
And th that discrete set of inputs corresponds to the individual Q values for each agent's actions, which thanks to the monotonicity, monotonicity constraint can be individually maximized over. Okay, now when the, when the students pitched this idea to me, I was pretty skeptical. In, in fact, that's, that's an understatement. I was convinced it would never work. My reasoning was that if you preserve the decentralizability of the argmax, then you're still saddled with the key limitation of EDN, that it cannot represent the benefits of coordination. So like by definition, if an agent can select its action in a vacuum, then there can't be any benefit to coordinating with other agents. So this point is illustrated using the normal form games shown here on the slide. So on the left, we have a game whose value function is both linear and monotonic. So both VDN and QMix can represent it. In the middle, we have a game that is nonlinear, but still monotonic. So QMix can represent it, but VDN cannot. And on the right, we have a game that is both nonlinear and non-monotonic. So neither VDN nor QMix can represent it. And the point is that only the game on the right actually involves coordination because only there does one agent's choice depend on the other agent's choice. So the question then becomes, should we care about these games in the middle? Because it's these games that QMix can represent better than VDN. And my claim was, no, we, we don't really care about these games because even if VDN couldn't represent the value function of this middle game exactly, it could approximate it with the value function uh, of the left game. And when we perform greedy action selection on that approximation, we'll get exactly the same result as we would have gotten with QMix. So that was the sort of um, the foundation of my skepticism. However, the students had an insight that I had overlooked. Um, the point was that the value function is used not just for action selection. It's also used for bootstrapping. So the loss function, when we, when we fit this Q function, it's a mean squared error between a Q value and a target. And that target is computed by bootstrapping off of the Q value of the next state. That's the term shown in red here. So even if a monotonic mixing function doesn't select different actions than a linear mixing function in a given state, it can still better estimate the value of that state, which means less bootstrapping error and better action selection in earlier states as we propagate that value backwards. So this um, two-step game illustrates this point. So in the first step, the red agent's action is irrelevant and the blue agent's action determines whether in the second step they play, they go to state 2A or 2B. So in 2A, the payoff is seven regardless of their actions. And in 2B, um, the payoff is eight, but only if they both select the right action. Okay, so let's see what happens if we apply VDN and QMix to this game. So VDN can accurately represent the value of 2A, but not 2B. In 2B, it actually correctly identifies the best action, but it underestimates its value. Now, crucially, these errors in the, in the value estimates, they propagate backwards via bootstrapping to result in errors in the value function at the first step, leading the blue agent to suboptimally choose to transition to 2A instead of 2B. By contrast, QMix can represent the value function of 2A and 2B, uh, which via bootstrapping leads to lower error in the value function at the first step. And so the blue agent optimally chooses to transition to 2B. So this illustrates how this, how this difference can matter um, even if the true value function is monotonic. Okay, so how do we actually enforce this monotonicity constraint? QMix does this using three networks an agent network, a mixing network, and a hyper network. So the middle part of this figure shows the, the basic setup. So here we have the agent networks, which share parameters. And uh, these agent networks, they produce individual Q values, one for each agent. They're then fed into a mixing network, which is constrained to have non-negative weights to ensure monotonicity. And it produces the joint Q value. So on the right, we have like a zoomed in closer look at the agent network, which is just a conventional deep neural network that has both feed forward and recurrent layers. And on the left, we have a closer look at the mixing network whose weights here are not learned directly, but instead specified as the output of a separate hyper network shown here in red. And the hyper network conditions not only on the individual Q values that were produced by the agent networks, 
but also on the global state. And that's allowed because we're only going to use the mixing network during the training phase. And like the critic, we're going to throw it away before we deploy. Now, the reason for using this hyper network instead of directly specifying the, uh, the weights of the mixing network is to allow the value function to more flexibly condition on this global state. So without the mixing network, the relationship between the state and the value function would have to be monotonic because of the non-negative weights that we insist on having in this mixing network. Whereas with a hyper network, QMIX can in principle specify an arbitrarily different mixing function for every state. Now in the execution phase, we discard the mixing network and each agent acts greedily with respect to its individual Q values, which thanks to this monotonicity constraint is guaranteed to maximize the joint Q function. Okay, so, um, um, sorry, right, here we go. So in, in these plots, we see the max over the estimated Q values in nine random matrix games, both for QMIX and VDN, compared to the true max, which is shown in the dash lines. So what these plots show essentially is that the students were right. QMIX is consistently better than VDN at approximating the max over the Q values. And it's this quantity, the max over the Q values, that in a sequential setting would be used for bootstrapping. So this is gonna reduce the, the bootstrapping error. Now, of course, this is just a sanity check. So for a proper evaluation of QMIX, we use uh, the StarCraft Multi-Agent Challenge, or SMAC, which is a suite of cooperative multi-agent RL benchmark tasks that we created based on the popular real-time strategy game, StarCraft II. Now, as we know from supervised learning, from single agent reinforcement learning, good benchmarks are really crucial for driving progress in the field. So that's why we created SMAC and open sourced it along with PyMarl, which is our software engineering framework that includes implementations of our and other key cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithms. It makes it easy to extend these algorithms and build new ones. Now in StarCraft, Human players compete against each other or against the game AI to gather resources, uh, build armies, and defeat opponents. You've probably heard about Alpha Star, which is DeepMind's like wildly successful StarCraft playing agent. Um, while Alpha Star also uses StarCraft II, the setting is actually only superficially similar to Smack. While Alpha Star considers the full game, it does so with a centralized policy with one of these puppeteer agents that directs all the units, as in a multi-agent MVP. But at the same time, it contains uh, fully competitive aspects and uses self-play techniques to train against a, like an evolving suite of opponents. In SMAC, we want to benchmark DECPOM DP. So we focus on micromanagement, which is the fine-grained fine -grain control of individual units. And we create a fully cooperative setting by fixing the agent's policy to that of the game AI. More importantly, there's no puppeteer but instead each agent is controlled by, uh, uh, each unit is controlled by a separate agent. Now, as we know, the truly multi, to be truly multi-agent, we need partial observability, which SMAC introduces by limiting the sight range of each agent as shown in the figure. Now, um, SMAC consists of a bunch of different maps as shown here. We have symmetric maps um, in which both teams have the same type and number of agents. We have maps where both teams have the same type of agents, but the opponent has more of them. And finally, we have asymmetric maps where the two teams have different types of agents. Now, in the original QMIX paper, we just reported results on a few maps. It was like a proof of concept. But now that we have SMAC, we can do uh, larger scale benchmarking so we can evaluate across all 14 maps. Now, I don't want to bore you with like dozens of plots. So I'll just show you this summary plot. And what this shows is the number of maps out of 14, which each method, for which each method has the best performing policy at each point during training. And again, the students were right. So QMIX's richer mixing function, it really pays off. This hump in the middle, um, this indicates that QMIX tends to learn faster than the other methods. And while those methods uh, do eventually catch up on a few maps, the right part of the figure shows that QMIX often learns substantially better policies even in the long run. Um, and now note that to have the best policy on a map, we require that it actually be epsilon better than the alternatives. So even when QMIX is not winning on a map, that doesn't imply that it's losing. It typically just means that it's tying. 
And this is typically because, for example, there are some very difficult maps where none of the methods make much progress or where there's a ceiling effect where the map is easy and everyone does well. Now, the alternative methods that we're comparing against here, these include independent Q learning, which I discussed, as well as VDN, um, and also COMA. And COMA is an actor critic method that we also developed in my lab. It uses a, um, a centralized critic, which I mentioned before, um, and it also has some other innovations. It has a clever baseline, uh, which reduces variance, um, in particular, the variance that arises from what we call multi-agent credit assignment. Um, it's more sophisticated algorithmically than QMix. And, and the Coma paper, ironically, actually did win a best paper award. Um, but when you start doing careful benchmarking across a, a number of maps, it becomes clear that, that QMix, despite its simplicity, is much stronger empirically. We've tried out a number of ideas to improve performance on StarCraft, as have researchers in, in several other labs, um, not without success, but, but with mixed success. And um, as I alluded to before, QMix, it often proves surprisingly hard to beat, uh, retaining a competitive or in some cases even state-of-the-art performance on, on a number of maps. So let's take a closer look at the factors that contribute to QMix's performance. So here we see the results of some ablation experiments where we compare QMix not only to VDN, but to what we call QMix NS. So it's QMix, but where the mixing network doesn't condition on the global state. And also something we call VDNS, where um, it's VDN, but with a state-dependent bias in its linear mixing. So it's QMix where we take away conditioning on the state, and it's VDN where we add conditioning on the state. Now, what these plots show is that conditioning on the state is an important factor in performance, at least on some maps, and that doing so with a state-dependent bias is actually not good enough. Um, the more flexible approach of QMix involving a hypernetwork um, results in stronger performance. Now, here we have another ablation experiment where we compare QMix to what we call QMix Lin. So that's QMix where the mixing function is restricted to be just one linear layer. And again, we're plotting median test win percentage. Now, as expected, the original QMix with nonlinear mixing performs noticeably better. However, here's where things get kind of weird. If we actually look at the learned mixing functions, they're not like strictly linear, but they look pretty close to being linear. And we've done this analysis on a number of maps, but what I'm showing here is just an example from the, the two Colossi versus 64 Zerglings map just because it's easier to visualize when there's only two agents on our team. So what we see on the left is the mixing function for the initial state. And on the right, it's the uh, mixing function for the state at time step 50. So what's going on here? Uh, to figure it out, we created yet another ablation that we call QMix2 lid. So like QMix, it has two layers in the mixing function, but like QMix lin, th these layers are only linear. Now, what your machine learning textbook will tell you is that putting linear layers on top of each other won't increase the representational capacity because a linear combination of linear functions is still just a linear function. However, what your textbook won't tell you, but what is probably obvious to any uh, you know, deep learning practitioner is that adding such layers can greatly affect the learning dynamics and sometimes favorably so. In fact, that's what's illustrated in this plot. This is actually not an RL experiment. This is just a regression task of predicting fixed Q values. So the y-axis is just a, a mean squared error. And what you can see is that QMix2 lin learns much faster than QMix lin, even though they both use linear mixing. In fact, it even matches the performance of QMix with nonlinear mixing. And um, sure enough, this result holds up when we actually do RL. So the performance of QMix and QMix2 lin are quite similar and are substantially better than that of QMix lin when we again consider um, median test win percentage. Now, we can try to encourage QMix to learn uh, nonlinear mixing functions by changing the activation function from an ELU, that's what we were using, to TANH. And when we do that, indeed, we do see more nonlinearity in the learned mixing functions as shown uh, in the plots at the top here. However, as these plots at the bottom show, 
that does not translate into uh, improved performance. The, the performance difference by changing the activation function is modest at best. Okay, so the takeaways from these experiments are um, value function factorization is highly effective in these tasks. Flexibly conditioning on the state, not just with a state dependent bias, uh, but with a richer hyper network is also important. Um, so it's really important to richly parameterize the mixing function. VDN and QMix with a single la linear layer, they're not sufficient. However, um, as much as we might wish it was otherwise, nonlinear mixing does not seem to be important, um, at least not in SMAC. So that, that's definitely an unexpected result. Okay, so um, now I have a confession to make. Uh, earlier when I said the whole talk would be devoted to one method, I was kind of lying. Um, so since I have a few more minutes, I want to quickly tell you about one other method, uh, a method called Maven, because it's closely related to QNIX, uh, and it has actually shown improved performance on, on several maps. So the motivation for Maven comes from the following plots. So the, the SMAC maps are divided into three categories, the easy maps, the hard maps, and the super hard maps. And what these plots show you is the median test win uh, performance of all the same methods we've been talking about on the super hard maps. And well, there, there's no way to get around it. The, the results are embarrassing. On three of the five maps, all of the methods completely flatline. And on the other two, QMix is the only one that makes any progress. So one hypothesis as to what's going on here is that these super hard maps, they're precisely the ones that require the kind of non-monotonic coordination, non-monotonic mixing that neither QMix nor VDN can represent. However, this um, raises a question. Why does Coma also fail on these maps? So remember, Coma uses a centralized but unfactored critic. So there's no explicit mixing here, but there are also no constraints on the kinds of value function that can be learned, assuming the network is adequately parameterized. So this leads to a second hypothesis, which is that to learn these non-monotonic mixing functions, whether explicitly or implicitly, we need smart exploration. And this is, this is really pretty intuitive if you think about it. If the value function really requires the agents to coordinate to get the best payoff, then that means they have to find the needle in the haystack of this like joint action space. And this is a hard exploration problem. Now note also that QMix, like all the other methods we've discussed, uses naive exploration, in this case, epsilon greedy. And this is actually much worse than doing epsilon greedy in a single agent setting because each agent is separately performing its own epsilon weighted coin flips. So what that means is that for any reasonable value of epsilon, the chance of selecting a joint action in which more than one or two of the agents deviate from the greedy action at the same time is vanishingly small. So it's not surprising that QMix's performance is known to be sensitive to this epsilon annealing schedule because it's relying on this naive exploration uh, for this like crucial exploration of the joint action plates. Okay, so uh, multi-agent variational exploration or MAVEN is a method that's built on QMix and is designed to address these limitations. So it does so by using a latent space to represent a diverse ensemble of monotonic approximations. So in each episode, a latent policy shown here samples a value X, which is encoded together with the initial state into a latent variable Z. And Z is used by a team of QMix-like agents whose agent and mixing functions now condition on Z. The agent and the mixing functions, they're optimized with the DQN loss, just like in QMix, um, while the latent policy is optimized using policy gradients. And in addition, the agent trajectories, they're encoded into the hidden state of a GRU and there's a third loss term, which encourages learning to maximize a variational lower bound on the mutual information between these encoded trajectories and this latent variable Z. So what this does is encourage visitation of diverse trajectories while at the same time making those trajectories identifiable given Z. So it, it separates the latent space into different exploration modes. So Maven can not only learn richer value function approximations, but because it learns this ensemble of monotonic mixers, 
but it also greatly improves expiration because rather than just like epsilon dithering around the greedy joint action, it can perform committed expiration by fixing Z for a whole episode. It, what, and what this does is it yields diverse trajectories that are needed to, to find this needle in the haystack. So these plots show the, the, how these enhancements pay off on, on a couple of these super hard maps I mentioned before. Now, these results are for 10 million steps rather than 2 million steps on the earlier, as we had on the earlier plots. So this gives QMix um, and sometimes even IQL a chance to also make progress even on these super hard maps. But in both cases, uh, Maven performs a lot better. And um, we can also get some insight into what Maven is doing by looking at some TSNE plots of the initial state. So um, what, what we then do is, we, so we do these TSNE plots and then we label each point with a color corresponding to the Z value that Maven assigns to that state. And then moving from left to right, we see how these assignments change over time. So at the top, what we see, uh, we have the, the map 3S versus uh, 5Z. And what this map shows is that Maven is actually able to, to assign a different Z value to each of the different clusters of initial states. It actually identifies qualitatively different initial states and has a different expiration mode for each of them and a different monotonic uh, mixing for each of them. Now at the bottom, we have another super hard map called the corridor map. And here what we see is that Maven actually learns to shift um, probability mass from a low performing mode to a high performing mode, um, as opposed to QMAC, QMIX, which would be at risk of just getting stuck in a local optimum. Okay, um, if you uh, are interested in these, um, these methods, I encourage you to have a look at um, some of our papers. There's the original QMIX paper from ICML 2018, and there's also an extended journal version which has all these ablations and, and analysis that I um, sort of sketched for you, which has been accepted to Jimler and will, will hopefully appear soon, but the, the, there's a version of it already available on archive. Uh, and finally, the Maven paper, which was published at NeurIPS um, last year. So um, in conclusion, QMIX is a simple, effective method for value fu function factorization in cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning. Our empirical results make, I think, a pretty good case that such factorization is quite crucial to performance. Um, however, one caveat is that the comparison between QMIX and COMA, which I showed you, is confounded by the fact that factorization of the value function is not the only difference between these two methods. So COMA is an on-policy actor-critic method, and QMIX is an off-policy Q-learning method. Fortunately, we've recently developed a method which enables a more controlled comparison. So COMIX is another variant of QMIX that's designed to work with continuous action spaces. So it uses the cross-entropy method to approximate the maximization over this continuous action space, but it does this, this approximation again only in the local action space. So like QMIX, it exploits this decentralization of the max, but now the local maximization is performed approximately using the cross-entropy method because this local action space is continuous. Okay, now using QMIX, we can eliminate this confounder by comparing QMIX to a method called multi-agent deep deterministic policy gradients, or MADDPG, which is a method from OpenAI that's similar to COMA, but which uses continuous actions and, and crucially is off policy. Um, However, um, in order to make a comparison between um, COMIX and MADDPG, we need a continuous action benchmark for cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning. And it turns out that nothing suitable really existed. So what we did was we created our own uh, called multi-agent Mujoko. So this consists, consists of a set of traditional Mujoko robot control tasks that have been decentralized such that there's a separate agent controlling each of the, of the robot's joints. And our empirical results in this setting, what they show kind of at a high level, is that with its factored value function, COMIX performs significantly better than MADDPG, whose centralized critic is not factored. However, if we introduce a QMIX style factorization to MADDPG's critic, a method we call fact MADDPG, then the performance difference totally goes away. So what this suggests is that it's actually um, not that important whether you're on policy or off policy, 
whether your method is actor critic or cue learning, but a good factorization of the value function is crucial. So um, I'll just mention to conclude um, that there's a lot of innovation happening in the field right now. There's a lot of new frontiers that are being explored. Um, these include new factorizations that go beyond QMix. So one of the things that we're doing in my group is using tensor decompositions to more flexibly factorize the joint Q function. So you can actually show that a QMix factorization corresponds to a rank one, um, a tensor decomposition, but you could consider rank two, rank three, and so on richer um, factorizations of the value function by using higher rank tensor decompositions, which no longer have this decentralizability property, but if you're factoring the critic in an actor critic approach, you don't need that property and you can exploit richer factorizations. Um, also, some new algorithms are being developed and some results are coming soon that show that PPO-based methods uh, can completely upend the state of the art in this area, um, possibly even changing our conclusions about, you know, uh, you know, when it's necessary to centralize learning at all. Independent learning algorithms do much better when, when powered by, by modern actor critic methods like PPO. So, um, the, you know, the game is changing quickly. There'll be some, some new results about that soon. Um, there's also a lot of interest in developing uh, new architectures. We're starting to look at using transformers, uh, not only for the kind of problems that I've already mentioned, but also for like transfer and meta-learning problems where you want to train on, on one or a set of maps and then um, transfer to a different map that might have a different number of agents or different kinds of agents, or your agents might be the same, but the, the, the game AI may have a different number of entities. So to flexibly transfer across those kind of domains, things like transformers can, can be really helpful. Um, and finally, uh, there's also interest in, in new applications. Smack is a great benchmark problem, but you know there's more to life than, than StarCraft. So we really need to have new challenges to make sure we don't overfit to, to something like StarCraft. Um, there's a, been a great development recently called Google Research Football. It's a new benchmark problem, which can be easily decentralized to, to uh, represent a deck PMDP. Um, and it's quite similar to like a RoboCup simulation league, but it's set up in a way that makes it really easy to apply deep learning methods. So, um, uh, you know, we're putting some, some effort into developing methods that can solve uh, this benchmark problem too. Okay, that's it. Um